Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm No02, and thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. This is an Act 2 team composition deck. There's a couple of things going on here. A couple of things I need to get through. First is Amped Up. Yes, I know. Amped Up. Very strong. Everyone, you either you love it or you hate it, because it's pretty much a must-include for just about any deck now. A couple of quick things about Amped Up. Uh, Amped Up does trigger on Act 4. Amped Up does seem to be a little bugged when triggering for during the first stage of the Abomination. The first stage being the tentacles on the street side. Every time you kill one of those tentacles, it's supposed to call a horde, but sometimes you, it doesn't work. Amped Up doesn't trigger. But during the tonsil fight, stage 2, when you're in the little pit shooting at his mouth... When the Abomination roars, it triggers a horde. And even though that's not the same audio cue that we're used to as far as amped up triggering, right, the, the howling, it actually triggers amped up. And then for the third stage of, of the Abomination, amped up doesn't really trigger ever again. Really nice to know. But what's important about this as well is that amped up only triggers on the audio cue of a horde being spawned. That's an important distinction to make because the reason why I've chosen Act 2 for a new team composition is because of Amped Up. Act 2 is by far the best of all the acts for running Amped Up. Now, Amped Up is great on literally all of the act for, for on literally all of the acts. There's there's value somewhere in it. It triggers all the time. And every single act has forced horde events that allow us to get value out of Amped Up. But, Act 2, every single one of the finales has either an infinite horde that triggers Amped Up multiple times, or for Grave Danger, you are guaranteed 5 to 6 hordes when you kill the 5 snitches. 6 if you trigger the fifth snitch but don't actually kill it and then kill it it triggers again anyways that's nuance right because uh, as an example the abomination third stage amped up triggers once on the diner of act one when you turn on the generator to start powering the diner beginning the timer that spawns at the top center of your screen Amped up triggers. A horde howl is heard. But after that, amped up won't trigger ever again. It's actually a little sneaky thing that you can do, though, if you're on the diner. Uh, if you avoid triggering all of like the alarmed cars in the parking lot of the diner, and then start the horde event, in the middle of the horde event, somebody can jump up and shoot one of those alarmed cars, and it'll trigger another howl, and you'll get amped up and all that stuff again, pumped. You can, you can space them out over the... Anyways. Right? But it amped up only triggers once naturally on the diner. Same thing for Rolling Thunder. You shoot the shell, you get the howl, you get amped up triggered. But unless you hear that howl again, amped up won't trigger anymore. Won't trigger anymore. Uh, same thing for T5 on Act 3. Uh, it's just an infinite horde. Amped up triggers once at the start and then doesn't trigger again for the rest of the mission. Right, the distinction that we're making here is that there are technically two types of infinite hordes here because on the handyman we have infinite horde, but it's a corruption card and there's a timer. When the timer hits zero, a horde is called, you get the audio cue, amped up triggers. And on the handyman, it triggers over and over and over and over and over again. Whereas for the Diner, Rolling Thunder, T5, it's a horde that is triggered, but the duration of that horde trigger is infinite. Whereas for Handyman, for Broken Bird, those are infinite hordes, but it's infinite triggers stacking on top of each other as opposed to one trigger going on infinitely. So Act 2 is unique in that Amped Up will trigger multiple times in the finales of Act 2, or Amped Up doesn't trigger multiple times in the finales of 1 and 3 and 4. Thus, the inspiration. Let's get into the decks. The other thing that I want to talk about here is um, th these are some complicated decks as far as how they interact with each other. 
and not super complicated. I'm sure we can get more complicated out there, but I think these decks really go to show how different characters can be picking different cards at different times and interacting with each other and allowing the entire team to be slowly building up to what their deck is supposed to accomplish because other characters can fill in the gaps for them, sort of pick up the support cards, some utility cards, can pick up these other cards that are sort of comfortably placed on everyone, allowing everyone to make progress power-wise and still interact with each other and still get benefits, blah, blah, blah. But we'll start off with Walker. Walker's deck is the simplest. When it comes to damage, there's there's no there's no context-wise per map as to, to as to when and why you get more bullet damage or less bullet damage and things like that. It's just you get more bullet damage. So share the wealth and cross trainers. Every character's gonna have these in their two card slots, first two card slots here. Everyone's gonna have share the wealth. It's a sixteen hundred copper gain for the team per mission. And then cross trainers just for that comfortable bit of stamina and movement speed. When it comes to being the sniper, I find that I always prefer getting reload speed before bullet damage just because you don't always end up fighting the sniper rifle that you want or with the attachments that you want. Reload speed is a nice way to universally increase your DPS if you were to have a sniper rifle because you shoot faster. If you don't have a sniper rifle, it's going to make whatever other guns you have way more comfortable to use in horde events as well as be able to mag dump and reload and mag dump again into mutations if DPS is called upon things like that. So we just get Wide Mouth Magwell, Cold Brew Coffee for Call to Arms, and then Reload Drills for the Handyman. And the idea here is just that if you can save one grenade because you guys are confident that you can burst down a Reeker uh, that's charging you and things like that, or burst down a Crusher who's, who's coming at you, right? Things like that. Because Walker is able to do just enough DPS to get there. That's the point here. That's why we're just... Walker is straight up DPS. That's what he's focusing on. Going in the pipe cleaners, though, we're going to pick up surplus pouches. And we're going to take advantage of the fact that Walker gives the entire team an extra 10 points of health, negating the, the, the ill effect of the surplus pouches, giving the entire team extra grenade slots, allowing some of the other characters to skip picking up grenade slots here so that they can hit their power spike in a different way. But we like, we like extra grenade slots for pipe cleaners because that's a tight, confined space. So if a toll boy shows up, it can really ruin your day. So having the extra grenades over the course of the mission will allow you to progress more comfortably, keep your team more healthy. Reckless strategy. I like getting weak spot damage before any other damage just because once you do have a sniper rifle, when you pick up this weak spot damage, you hit a power spike. When you hit a power spike specifically versus all of the Stinger variants and the Wretch and the Exploder. Because they have such easy to hit weak spots, once you have a decent sniper rifle and Reckless Strategy, you'll be one-shotting or two-shotting all of the Stinger variants if you hit the weak spot, uh, as well as potentially the Wretch or the Exploder. And if not, you're doing so much damage that you're most likely stumbling them as well. So picking up this one card sort of makes you extra lethal versus the majority of the specials that you're going to be encountering. And then we just start getting damage. Damage, stock pouch, silver bullets, and uh, three different damage types. Bullet damage, uh, damage with sniper rifles, and the weak spot damage. Three different damage types, that's super important. Whatever damage deck you're running, your first two or three damage cards should be different damage types because they're multiplicative with each other. And maximize our damage as quickly as possible. Now we pick up mandatory PT for Broken Bird. Uh, being able to move and groove and get out of danger and run from a holdout point to the next crate quickly enough, things like that can be really, really nice. Especially, too, when you actually get a crate up and the hordes stop temporarily. That's going to be your time to spread out, gather loot, heal, hit up the... Uh, toolkit room if you have a toolkit for that map having this extra stamina and stamina region is going to help you traverse this map quickly allowing you to get to the crates under pressure faster run away from the horde one person can constantly potentially kite around the horde uh, it's going to give you more options and uh, just make this mission way way easier i think now we pick up patient hunter and uh, 11 is 
Heroes of the Worm. And this is a great, 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 great map for Patient Hunter because Heroes of the Worm is when you open up the gate and then there's an ogre all the way down the street. Uh, Walker's going to be able to just open up the gate, ADS, hold it, get his max damage stacks, ogre pops out of the ground, unload his sniper rifle into it, reload, ADS, max damage stacks, and just rinse and repeat because you have so much time for that for that ogre to walk down the street towards you guys. That walker is going to be gaining tons of value out of Patient Hunter. Now we pick up Marked for Death. Uh, give the entire team bonus damage now versus the bosses. Hyper focused for Grave Danger. Regardless of what's happening, if a walker can hit a weak spot on one of the breakers, it's going to do it's going to do mega damage. It's going to do mega damage, and we no longer need to move very much because. Chances are you're holding out in the church anyways, flash banging the door infinitely, things like that. You do crap ton of damage. Confident Killer. I love Confident Killer on Grave Danger because Grave Danger you have to kill five snitches. All five of those snitches trigger Confident Killer. So you're guaranteed five stacks by the time the breaker shows up. Another thing players like to do on Grave Danger is stack some of the snitches together so they'll go find a snitch to find another one and then they'll herd two together or herd four together things like that right people like to herd the snitches together run around loot you also like to buy extra wire extra grenades extra stuff piggyback it back and forth between the safe room and the church right that all takes time every couple of minutes a mutation is spawning so while your guys are taking time to set up before you start killing the snitches, mutations are spawning and showing up, and that is that is confident killer farming time. This is a great map. Great, great, great map. Same thing for the diner and um, uh, what you call the barroom blitz. Great maps, actually, for confident killer. It's because there's a setup time for the team of running stuff back and forth, and so extra spawns happen, and you get time to farm confident killer. And then glass cannon. Again, just damage, damage, damage. You can't die if you kill everything before it gets to you, right? So the idea here is that just Walker's just going to double down on having all the damage infinitely, all the damage all the time. His bullets, if he has, if you have like a purple barrette with like good attachments on it and all these cards, your your bullets are going to be like mini grenades, basically. You're going to be shooting mini grenades out of your Barrett, basically, essentially. That's Walker Stack. Walker's going to be the only character who has Glass Cannon right at the end. All the other characters are going to have Well Fed. It's actually going to negate Glass Cannon's effect here. But um, just Well Fed. You'll see. We'll, we'll talk when we get there. Now, Utility Evangelo. Things are going to start getting a little bit complicated. Share the Wealth Cross Trainers. Extra Money. Movement Foundation. Support Scavenger for the team. We're not running any sort of like spam Healy things as far as what Doc is going to be running. But just the extra general loot is going to be really, 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 really nice over time. You guys don't have to worry about buying lots of extra supplies as far as meds go. Chances are, don't buy pain pills or bandages. You'll find them on the map. Like, guaranteed, you'll find a couple on the map. The only medical supplies that you should be buying now is med kits as needed, as able to, things like that. And for Doc to obviously be using them. And on your mark now. So Evangel has two support cards here. On your mark is basically going to give you infinite ammo. The same way that amped up triggers on every map multiple times. On your mark is the same thing. So from call to arms to handyman to broken bird. You have infinite health and infinite ammo. Virtually, right? So long as you don't squander all your ammo and don't take damage for free. You guys are going to be very beefy and bullets are going to be flying. Mandatory PT now picked up for the Handyman. Just to give the entire team more stamina. Not necessarily more movement speed. Remember, we have Evangelo on our team. So the entire team is going to have 8% bonus movement speed because we have everyone's going to have cross trainers as well as Evangelo's bonus movement speed. More than enough to do Handyman. The extra stamina now is just going to allow your team to get out there, kill some of the, kill some of the nodes, and then get to a holdout spot comfortably when the next timer hits. 
and then surplus pouches again. Give the entire team extra grenades. The entire team is going to have three grenade slots at this point with only two cards. Hoffman will have, obviously, extra. Things like that. Again, for pipe cleaners, because confined spaces blow up tall boys. You win. Now, Evangelo's picking up Amped Up. Card seven is Hinterland. And um, this is a really nice card to pick up Amped Up, if you haven't already. Just because on Hinterland, you, you have a nest, which is a guaranteed four triggers for Amped Up right at the end. But right before the nest, at the end of Hinterland, you have the Flooded Warehouse. And on Nightmare Mode, that warehouse is a 100% alarmed. It's a 100% alarmed door getting into it. And a pretty good chance of the uh, other side of the warehouse also being alarmed. And I think the Flooded Warehouse is the hardest part of Hinterland. That seems to be where everyone gets stuck. There's things jumping out of the water at your feet and hitting you from behind. And people are trying to get up on top and you get stuck there. So, and also you have to, unless you have an extra toolkit, you have to alarm door your way into it. And if that bathroom door on the side is, is boarded up, um, there's no good place to hold out at that immediate area you have to like brute force your way through half of the warehouse to the high ground and it's just not possible all the time so having this extra bit of health for that flooded warehouse very very nice then evangelo picks up speed demon uh movement speed is nice because he's gonna be evangelo is gonna be dipping his toe into the idea that he can potentially speed clutch missions if he has to but what we're really interested in is the reload speed because now he's gonna get in the zone for uh, the clog. And Evangelo's extra reload speed, and he's using an SMG, which already has naturally good reload speed. Evangelo is going to have the ability to hold off hordes out in the open. Right? If you got a nice choke point, then you can hold off any amount of zombies with any weapon, so long as you know how to shoot the weapon and punch occasionally. But this reload speed is going to be really, really, really nice because Trailer Park. Or not Trailer Park, uh, The Clog, as well as Broken Bird, you don't really get that nice, super clean choke point a lot of the times. You're going to be out in the open. you can be scrappy. Zombies coming from every direction. Evangelo is going to be really good at shooting zombies here, to here, blah, 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 and reload really super fast and change directions and shoot here. And Evangelo will have the ability to 360 no-scope lots and lots of zombies if he's active and quick. It's just going to be really, really, really beneficial to having all this extra reload speed if you're fighting a horde semi out in the open. Cool brew, cold brew coffee, again, help with the reload speed. But also the use speed here is really nice when, when it comes to hooking up the crates. And we get Shredder. We're sort of changing a quick little direction here, right, into, into DPS. Extra reload speed means that Evangelo will, will be guaranteed to maintain his shredder stacks on the boss if that's what he's shooting at. Evangelo's main job is going to be shooting at zombies first, but if it seems to be cleared, then of course he can then turn and shoot the boss as well and give the entire team extra damage, as well as even potentially just mag dump the boss, reload, and then start focusing on zombies and things like that and sort of go back and forth. Reload drills for reload speed and wide mouth magwell. I love reload speed on SMGs. It's so much fun. You're gonna shoot, 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 shoot. Always, always be reloading. Always, always be shooting. Silver bullets. Uh, it's kind of nice to pick up silver bullets. It's not a huge deal. We're just sort of, we're just trying to squeeze out as much damage as possible now. And I choose silver bullets because if you're at the back of the church here on Grave Danger, um, shooting at the front door, I think for some of the SMGs is technically out of its range. This will make sure it's almost everything you're shooting at the front door of the church is in range plus 7.5% bullet damage maximizing your DPS and then well fed if your team gets here right because remember 14 and 15 are additional cards if your team dies extra health so that if the breaker gets inside instead of getting one shotted you get two shotted maybe three shotted things like that taking an extra hit a little bit extra time things like that beneficial for well fed Share the Wealth, Cross Trainers, Poultice, and Amped Up. 
for Doc. Doc is going to be he uh, big heals, as well as some interesting damage right at the end. Share the wealth and cross trainers as our money and movement foundation. Poultice is great. Poultice synergizes with support scavenger because pain pills are now bandages as well. So Doc can heal with lit literally everything. So at any point you come across anything, pick it up, heal somebody. They're topped off. They're good to go. Poultice is also like a huge healing efficiency card as well. And thus uh, Poultice EMT bag and upgraded med kits will provide your team with more than enough health per med kit restore. And then amped up because Call to Arms has the Ness at the start, which is again four guaranteed triggers on, on Call to Arms. But also too, when you get to the government building at the very end, you pass you pass the like the shanty bridge, going into that like official government looking -y building, town hall building. On nightmare mode, like every single one of those doors is alarmed. Like like literally all of them, it feels like. And thus you have like three or four guaranteed triggers almost right towards the end, allowing your team the option of either pushing your way forward, giving your team literally a full heal if your team needs it, and giving your team the option to pop one door at a time, hold off the horde, pop one door at a time, hold off the horde, if you have grenades for it and things like that. Now we pick up Medical Professional. Hopefully trauma is not a huge issue here. And it can be hard to afford enough med kits at this point in the game. But if you can, it's great. We have Medical Professional here because Hoffman on his card 5 for Handyman has Needs of the Many, giving the entire team plus one life. I don't know if you guys have ever died on the Handyman and watched your teammates run around. Typically when you die, eventually at some point you should respawn. And all the other missions... It's pretty clear you die behind a certain trigger, your teammates push forward, you spawn ahead of them, they come and they save you. The handyman, though, is not so clear cut. In fact, spawning, respawning on the handyman is super janky. It does, I don't know what, what triggers it, why it works when it doesn't work. I've watched people be dead for, for 20 minutes as people ran around the handyman. A third person dies. And then five seconds later, they instantly respawn. The people who died at the start of the mission, they never get an opportunity. I don't know why. Respawning on Handyman is jank. It's super weird. Thus, having the extra life from Needs of the Many on Hoffman means that somebody's not going to die instantly when they go down. And then having Medical Professional pick them up, heal them with a med kit, they get their life back. The goal is that we're trying to basically avoid somebody respawning or not respawning because it's not consistent on Handyman with these two cards, giving the entire team the the, the benefit of the, the down mechanic and getting an extra life. Really, really convenient. So if things aren't going super well on Handyman, they're not going to, it's not going to go off a cliff immediately because you get this extra life. They go down, you pick them up, sort of reset. You don't have to worry about the RNG of somebody respawning or not. And sometimes, too, somebody respawning, you want to, want to go save them. But that's actually the incorrect thing to do because it takes so much time and it gets you killed. Either way, medical professional needs of the many can help you avoid that problem entirely if you get there. Now going into pipe cleaners, we pick up Inspiring Sacrifice. Doc has three grenade slots because Walker and Evangelo are running surplus pouches. Thus allowing Doc to skip picking up a grenade slot here and allowing her to get Inspiring Sacrifice. Just how, right, we're picking up grenades because pipe cleaners is such a tight confined space. Tall boys, wretches, there's a lot of splash damage potential. Uh, we're running lots of grenades, so if a tall boy gets too close, you're throwing a grenade, that's more splash damage. If things go south, if things don't go well, Inspiring Sacrifice, nice team healing, nice splash damage heal, things like that. Again, we're sort of just three cards that if things go really, really badly, we still benefit from it, technically. And now Doc gets Boxo Bags, right? Boxo Bags. When you're playing in a team setting and you have a Doc on your team, 
everyone sort of knows that if we have the luxury of it, you should be dropping your medicine on the ground so that Doc can pick it up and heal you with it. Thus, getting these other support bags, not really the bang for our buck here, right? Box of bags is plus four, right? Net, net gain plus four. So with one card, we have more than these two cards combined for the team. And the negative effect is negated because they have Walker on the team. Kind of neat. Kind of neat, right? And thus, this is like the ultimate one support card here as far as just... You're going to have more than enough supplies now. You don't need to buy the... What is this going to be? Uh, two, four, six, eight support slots. You don't need to buy eight med kits. Remember, we have support scavenger. Doc should have two med kits. If you can afford four med kits, that's fine as well. The other two players can just carry whatever. It doesn't really matter. We have Poultice. Box of bags. And then we get EMT bag going into... What you might call it. Trailer trashed. EMT bag. And now at this point, regardless of what level your med kits are, if you have vanilla med kits, right? Non-upgraded med kits. This is a 95 point heal med kit with 15 points of trauma recovery. It's a full heal. Full heal and the bulk of the trauma, a nice chunk of tra trauma taken away. Nice thing about Poultice 2 is that if it sort of covers the trauma heal, plus 5, things like that. Now Doc picks up an extra grenade pouch going into the clog. Just to round out, just nice extra bit of damage, consistency. It could be whatever you... She can run whatever you need it to be. When it comes to grenade setups, I haven't talked about this yet. Grenade setups. Um, it should be mostly grenades or flashbangs. You probably only need three or four uh, pipe bombs at the most for any given mission. Everyone else should just be running grenades. Because between everyone shooting zombies and... And... Uh, Evangelist reload speed and things like that. Like, zombies shouldn't be a huge deal. Pop a pipe bomb here or there when it's critical. You should be good to go. Just blowing up tall boys. And then cold brew coffee. Again, cold brew coffee is such an easy card to include in every deck. Reload speed, aim speed, swap speed to your grenades. And then the use speed for the med kits as well as use speed for broken bird hooking up the crates. Now we switch gears here. Admin Reload, right? Our support combination is done. We have Support Scavenger, Poultice, Amped Up, Medical Professional, Inspiring Sacrifice, EMT Bag, Boxo Bags. We have plenty of support cards. We don't need more. We don't need more. In fact, the bulk of the campaign is behind us. Admin Reload. What the heck? I've been playing around with Admin Reload. Wasn't a big believer in it. I am still not a big believer in it. I'm sorry, guys. Admin Reload has its cool, cool moments. What Admin Reload does that no amount of other reload cards can do is that Admin Reload allows you the luxury of constant DPS. You can pretty much at the... Your reload speed becomes your swap speed, basically. And we swap decently fast now because we have Grenade Pouch and Cold Brew Coffee. 50% swap speed bonus. So we swap guns, we can keep shooting, we swap back, we can keep shooting. I haven't really talked about gun loadouts. Walker's obviously running a sniper rifle, whatever secondary he wants. Evangelo has an SMG, whatever secondary he wants. Doc and Hoffman, I would recommend both run ARs. They should both be running ARs. The M4, the AK, or the SCAR are ideal. M16 is good as well. Ranch Lifel is great, but we don't really need more uh, mutation killing power. What you need is horde killing power. Just so you can save your pipe bombs. So admin reload. Doc is going to want an AR and then like a Glock or a Tech 9 for her secondary. Because then she's going to get power swap and just go into damage. And between having admin reload and power swap, Two cards, there's like no other two cards that are going to net gain you as much DPS potential as these two cards, but at the expense of a lot of ammo. You're going to be constantly shooting, but for the most part, like, 
Doc is just going to be constantly draining damage or health off of the bosses. As well as allow her to constantly shoot at the horde if that's what needs to be done. Things like that. So two cards, sort of bang for your buck. I'm not the biggest fan of Admin Reload because uh, sort of like Power Swap. I was a big fan of Power Swap and over time I got less enthused about it. The moments where Admin Reload are re is really, really, really good, where it's Admin Reload is super clutch, is is in those super duper intense moments. Where there's just tons of zombies everywhere and mutations and everything's all chaos. That's when Admin Reload really, really shines. Where you're just like, where you literally just have targets to constantly be shooting at. And as far as being in that position, the end of Act 2 is kind of like that. Because you have the, the Ogre on Heroes of the Worm, Ogre and a Breaker on Part 2, and then the Double Breaker at the end of uh, On Grave Danger. So plenty of opportunity here for Admin Reload to just be in constant use. And Doc will be doing that. Ammo Belt. Ammo isn't going to be a huge issue, I think, because of On Your Mark and all the triggers for it. As well as how short these missions are at the end of Act 2. If you have the money for it, Doc should be leaving the safe room with all of her ammo filled up. And plus, everyone else could be dropping ammo as well, things like that. But just to maintain the constant DPS, you don't have to look down and pick up ammo, right? Plus the extra reload speed here. No matter what weapons you got, ideally you probably want like bullet damage and magazine capacity. But whatever weapons you got, no matter what magazine size they have and their fire rate, between the 50% reload speed here and cold brew coffee reload speed, um, admin reload will finish reloading your empty weapon before you need to swap back to it. Because if admin reload gets weird, if you drain a gun, swap, drain that gun, and then swap back, and that first gun isn't actually finished reloading, admin reload can be kind of wonky as far as like. You swap back to your weapon, and the reload is cancelled, and you have to, like, fully reload again. Between having the reload speed of these two cards, that should almost never happen, regardless of what weapons you're using. And if we need extra damage, silver bullets, and then well-fed for the extra health and splash damage and things like that at the end. Hoffman. Hoffman's gonna be running grenade damage. You should, I recommend run him running an AR, and then a secondary of choice. Share the wealth, cross trainers, we know why. Grenade pouch. He's been picking up his grenade pouch earlier. Earlier, right? Because up, up until this point, no one else has extra grenades at the start. So Hoffman will have three. Right at the very beginning. Just to give the team extra consistency as far as getting through Call to Arms. Save your grenades. Be frugal with them. Because uh, you want to be using your grenades once you get to the a government building. That's the most tight, confined space. Not a lot of room to maneuver, as well as not a lot of distance to kill tall boys if they get too close. So, extra grenade pouch just to add that reliability over the course of Call to Arms. And amped up. So, on Call to Arms, we have two amped ups. That's 50 points of health per horde. That's a net gain of 200 HP for the entire team per horde. Once you get to Hinterland, you have three. Getting four amped ups, don't do it. Not worth it. Everyone has, what, 100, 110-ish points of health on average? How often are you going to be literally at death, death's brink, and then call a horde and get full health? Just not going to happen very often. So 75 points of amped up health is more than enough. Chances are you're not going to be getting all the value out of it consistently. But if you do, it's a huge boon. Needs of the many on five because of uh, the life and respawning jankiness on needs of the on uh, handyman. So having needs of the many and medical professional synergize with each other, where Doc gets medical professional and often picks up needs of the many, a card combination that we don't have to have one character suffer the burden of getting both cards. Another character can get the universal card. 
where the support actually just picks up the medical professional. Bomb Squad. Hoffman's grenades now will one-shot just about all of the Tollboy variants with a direct hit, uh, almost regardless of what uh, ferocious or monstrous that they are. It's gonna, Hoffman's grenades will heck them up, get them super close to death. Combat training. A temptation of grenades is throwing them at wretches. And, um, uh, and um, uh, the other guy. The, the Reekers. The Reekers. It's because they can show up too. Reekers have still a nice chunk of health. People might be reloading. It could be really, really scary. Hoffman with an AK or a Scar. And some sort of bullet stumble damage and color of gun and things like that. That all plays a factor. With combat training, Hoffman will be stumbling. Hoffman will have the ability to stumble... Uh, Wretch variants as well as the Stinger variants. Really, really nice convenience. Nice defense. All right, so uh, not all of the pressure is going to be on Walker to necessarily kill all the things before they hurt your team, all the specials. Hoffman can stumble things rather comfortably now as well. As well as Walker will also be able to stumble things rather well as, as comfortably as well. Hoffman will just add to that while still maintaining the crowd control uh, strength of running an AR, things like that. Improvise explosives. At this point, Hoffman's grenades will one-shot all of the mutation variants, and we're now beginning to dip our toe in the ability to... This is, a, this is how you dip your toe. Uh, dipping your toe into the ability to grenade dump bosses if you need to. Not ideal strategy at this point in the run, but if you're desperate, things are going south. The hag is going to get away with a quarter health. Throw a couple grenades and she's good to go. Cold brew coffee. The swap speed is nice for switching the grenades because that would be Hoffman's main job. The U speed for Broken Bird. Mandatory PT. Picking it up here. Just again to help the entire team move and groove around Broken Bird map. Super nice, super easy. Now we get Demolitions Expert. At this point, ammo capacity, not a big deal because these missions are so short. And again, we're just turning Coffin's grenades into just big boom nonsense. Grenade training for the extra damage. Confident killer because it triggers on grave danger so nicely. I also just wanted to avoid losing too much health here because there is a lot of splash damage potential now with Hoffman's grenades. If a breaker gets inside the church and he needs to grenade dump it and he's too close, he can kill himself. <laughs> so let's just make sure that everyone has as much health as possible. Though we can pick up down down in front if you he, if he need it or get there. Keep in mind too that Confident Killer is multi-plicative with all the other damage types. Down in front for the extra health and then just well fed. And Hoffman's grenade should be chunking bosses pretty decently. Along with everyone else's DPS and things like that. Bosses should be... That was just something else. Bosses should be easy to kill. We'll leave it at that. Anyways, that is the Act 2 composition amped up. Walker, Sniper, Van... You, you know, you can see... You can sort of see how the... You know, how complicated we can make these decks as far as connecting different cards between different characters and creating combinations that way. I think, again, just Back for Blood has a great foundation for future content, future cards, cleaners, mutations, campaigns, things like that. As well as a replayability and the uh, fun aspect of building new decks and things like that. There's some potential here. Let me know what you think of this deck. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. And I'll, uh, I'll see you guys in the future.